Good evening to everyone and welcome to today's session. <clears throat> we had a very long break in the past one week. We missed one class last week and uh, yesterday also. But uh, irrespective of all that, we are in our pursuit to finish general medicine before the exam date. That's going to be our target. So let's make, make the start. Last time, what did we study in nephrology? There is a broad classification of disorders, glomerulopathies, tubulopathies, and uh, malignancies of the genitourinary system, and cystic renal diseases. These are going to be the important areas uh, which we need to be very sure as a final year student of MBBS ready to go for exam. So doctor, how do we approach the problem of acute renal failure? History and physical examination is very important. Can you tell me one classical case of acute renal failure which you come across? Somebody who had uh, malaria, very common cause. Plasmodium falciparum, which is called the malignant form of malaria, all those gametocytes will lead to diminished renal flow and uh, land the person into renal failure. So acute renal failure in malaria, acute renal failure due to leptospirosis, these are the common things that we come across in the clinical practice. So history is very important and what is the duration of the renal failure? Is this problem persistent for long time or recently had fever following that creatinine has shot? That's very important. That's the reason always take a baseline creatinine which is a very important investigation. The next important thing is whether it is pre-renal, inter-renal or post-renal form of a renal failure we need to be very sure about. Already you know very well. What is meant by pre-renal? Any diminished blood flow to the kidney hypovolemia, hypotension, diarrhea or somebody had uh, burns and there is a third space fluid loss because of the burns and when the fluid slips into the extravascular space what happens to intravascular volume? It decreases and that decreases the blood flow to the kidney. Similarly, any drugs like ACE inhibitors or anesthetes, they will affect the afferent arteriole and efferent arteriole fine balance. As already we discussed, what decides the GFR doctor? Efferent arteriolar constriction or afferent arteriolar dilatation, they are the ones which will increase the blood flow and increase the filtration pressure and increase the GFR formation is what need to be ultimately remembered. Similarly, any tubular dysfunction like ischemic ATN or drugs like aminoglycosides is the person is receiving and conditions like monoclonal gammopathies like multiple myeloma where the light chains of the immunoglobulins can go to the kidney and they can act like a tubular toxic substances leading to the development of uh, tubular damage and tubular necrosis. Similarly, post renal causes which we already reviewed like uh, renal papillary necrosis, renal stones, retroperitoneal fibrosis, carcinoma of the cervix. What is a very common cause the people of carcinoma of cervix will be ultimately dying doctor? The carcinoma of the cervix will be involving parametrium and it will lead to the compression of the ureter leading to the development of uremia which is the underlying cause of the death very commonly in case of uh, metastatic cervical cancer is what you have to ultimately remember. So what is an important clue to say that this patient is suffering from pre-renal azotemia. Look for the signs of dehydration as we said any decreased intravascular volume is the underlying cause. Look for the presence of edema because Third space volume losses is the underlying cause of pre-renal failure. 
Similarly, if you are suspecting interstitial nephritis, commonly interstitial nephritis is because of drugs. Rifampicin, rifampicin, NSAIDs, any of them can lead to the development of interstitial nephritis. So, look for any allergic drug reaction which can point out that probably this patient's renal failure is because of interstitial nephritis is what need to be remembered. Then look for the possible signs of post renal obstruction. Do a rectal examination an elderly person whose urea creatinine is elevated. So that what will you get an important clue? BPH if it is there. Similarly any bladder dysfunction can be identified which is a post renal etiology. Take a drug history, do urine analysis, do the fractional excretion of the sodium, osmolality, urine, sodium, urine, creatinine, why? They will all differentiate between pre-renal, intrinsic renal and post-renal forms of the renal failure is what need to be remembered. You need to do a renal ultrasound in a patient of acute renal failure because if the acute renal failure is because of any post-renal cause, obstruction, that lead to hydronephrosis. So you look for the pelvic elysial system. A dilated pelvic elysial system in the kidney is a very important indicator that this acute renal failure is because of uh, post-renal obstructive pathology is what need to be fundamentally remembered. Now, is there any way that you can closely monitor a patient of acute renal failure every day what do you need to check in the ward daily weight why because the renal failure the, there is a fluid retention retained fluid will cause change in weight so fluid retention need to be monitored by daily weight checking as a house surgeon you need to check in a ARF patient every day how is the urine output and then fill the input output chart how is the urine output? Serum electrolytes, hemoglobin, hematocrit, and very commonly any patient of renal failure is vulnerable to infection, which you need to closely watch for. So quickly tell me doctor, what are the main differences between pre-renal azotemia versus intrinsic renal problem like ATN? The five important clues which you are not going to forget. Number one, osmolarity of the urine. If the urinary osmolarity is very high means what does it indicate? There is no water in the urine. All the water is reabsorbed by the tubule. If it is a pre-renal failure, tubules are still working. Hence, they will retain the water and urine osmolarity will be typically increased. If it is a tubular necrosis, the water retaining ability of the tubules is gone and that will lead to a decrease of the urine osmolality is what need to be understood. Similarly, urinary sodium, until the tubules are functioning, the urinary sodium will be less than 20 because sodium is retained. If the tubules are gone, what will happen? Sodium is lost into urine. Hence, urinary sodium will be high, more than 40. Then fractional excretion of sodium also is an important differentiator. It will be less than 1% in pre-renal and more than 1% in the case of the tubular necrosis. And if you look at the urinary sediment, if the tubule is necrosed, it leads to the formation of granular cars, which lead to brownish pigment granular cause in the urinary sediment is what you have to ultimately remember now let us quickly look into different types of urinary cause whenever you look at a cue report of any patient hyaline cause are there granular cause are there rbc cause are there lipid cause are there how to interpret in which pathologies you find these different types of cars, we have to be very sure. So, it is the degenerated granular debris which forms the granular cars. 
So if you find granular cost means there is an acute ongoing inflammation involving the renal tubules and nephron. Hence the presence of the granular cause defines a angry urinary sediment which is indicative of an underlying tubular pathology. So these are the typical cellular cause like the RBCs. You can have waxy cause and coarsely granular cause or a finely granular cause, the different forms of the cause. Where do these uh, cause form basically? The source of the cause in the nephron is typically the distal convoluted tubule and collecting duct. Proximal convoluted tubule and loop of Henle will never form cause. That's what need to be basically remembered. A very benign finding and a common finding is the presence of uh, hyaline cause. What is meant by hyaline cause? There is a mucoprotein called as Tom's Horsfall's protein which is being secreted by the tubular cells. Whenever the Tom's Horsfall proteins are produced in excess, then they lead to the development of this kind of hyaline cause, which is generally considered to be a very benign situation, nothing to alarm about it. So this pale looking refractile hyaline cause is one of the very common finding in the urinary sample is uh, what you need to fundamentally remember. Then you have what are called RBC, cellular cause. From where do they basically form? If there is any pathology in the glomerulus, then that lead to percolation of the RBCs, which lead to the formation of the RBC cause. Now, a very common finding is patient comes to you and say, doctor, my urinary report says there are a lot of RBC cause. Is there any serious problem in my kidneys? What is your answer? You should know that suppose if the patient is having UTI, urinary tract infection or urethritis or cystitis in the bladder, there can be a bleeding which can occur which can also lead to the formation of bloody clots. Any pathology in the glomerulus also can lead to the formation of bloody clots and cause. How do you differentiate? Look at the morphology of the RBCs. Instead of biconcave disc, if they are dysmorphic RBCs, it often points that they are originating from the glomerulus is what need to be remembered. Then a very important clue to say that the patient is having UTI is the presence of WBC CAS, which is highly indicative of acute pyelonephritis, which you need to emergently manage and treat. Otherwise, the patient will go into a gram-negative sepsis is what you have to fundamentally remember. So, any tubular cause always indicate that there is an injury to the tubular epithelium, specifically to the distal convoluted tubule is what you have to ultimately remember.